Well, are you ready to get into today's message? Just want to welcome everybody that's tuning in online. We have an online audience. Again, just you realize that the church is bigger than just us that are sitting here because God has uh, used technology to expand and just share the message around the world. And so we know that people are being blessed. And so again, you guys make that happen. But obviously, we are in the midst of a series, and we've been call, calling it, or the name of our series is called Slaying the Giant. And what we've really been addressing is, is slaying the giant of fear. And the culture in which we live in has really been dominated by fear in just really the last two years, hasn't it? And for that matter, if you don't know it, the devil tries to control the church by and through fear. So if you're a child of God, that is one of the things that he endeavors to work overtime is to try to get you into a place of fear. Do you realize that depression is nothing more than fear? Anxiety, worry, it's fear. When you get a bad report from the doctor and you're, you're, you're fretful, it, it's not the fact that you are overcome by the report. You're overcome by the spirit of fear that tries to grip a hold of you, right? And so fear is a big tactic of the enemy to come and try to overpower and become the giant in the life of a believer. And let me just say this as well, that what we're talking about, fear runs rampant within this earth. But when it comes to the child of God, that's where the enemy is working the hardest. Realize those that are not born again, that have not received Christ, the devil already has them in the family. So he's not necessarily trying to uh, get them into a position of fear. He's trying to control the people of God through fear. Amen? So if you notice that fear has been prevalent in your life, then you're in the right place at the right time because today you're going to get some tools to help address that giant that has been trying to control you in your life. Now, when it comes to fear and how God addresses it, God is not real tolerant of fear. You know, when it comes to us as parents, now, uh, just to tell you a little bit about me, everybody parents different, so you may not like the way our, I parent, and so that's fine. I didn't ask you for your opinion, and I didn't ask for an email or a text message, all right? I'm just going to tell you a, a, a moment as to how I parent, because everybody parents different. But when it comes to fear, you know, my children have the opportunity to get into fear just like your children do. And my youngest, he is nine right now, and so he's the one that is most susceptible to be fearful about things, you know, like at night going to bed and things of that nature. But when it comes to him being fearful, you know, I'm not real tolerant. I'll love him through it, but I don't say, oh, there, there, come crawl up in bed with me and try to pacify it. No, we address the fear that is trying to control the mind of that little boy. And so we encourage him and really enforce the fact that, listen, you're not going to act and cower down to fear. We'll talk it through. We'll love you through. But you're going to have to stand up and recognize that fear can't hurt you. Hello? And so when it comes to God, God is not real tolerant to fear. He's not going to coddle you and say, oh, come here, there, there. You know, everybody come, you know, gets afraid now and then. Now, the Bible says that concerning Jesus, Jesus was tempted in every manner that we were, yet without sin. So did he have opportunity to get fearful? Absolutely. He chose not to. And so when it comes to you in concerning fear, if you're expecting God to say, oh, listen, you poor thing there, I understand, you're not going to get that from God. And I'll prove it to you in a minute from the Word of God. Now, how many of you know that Jesus is empathetic, but he's not sympathetic. Empathetic means he understands. But Jesus isn't going to sit down there and, okay, come on, let's talk it through and give me all your sad story. Tell me what's going on. No, that's not going to be Jesus. And you might say, well, that's a little bit hard to understand. Let me say it this way as well. When it comes to fear... As a believer, you have absolutely no right to fear. And you might say, no right to fear. You have absolutely no right to fear. And I'll tell you in just a minute. But when we look at the scriptures concerning Luke chapter 8, these are the, the stories that we've been looking at for the last several weeks. And again, we've been using it as a platform to address this issue of fear in our life. Once again, in Luke chapter 8, you know the story. The Bible says that Jesus was with his disciples. They were on the bank, and Jesus said, let's get in the boat, and let's go to the other side. 
When he got in the boat, the Bible says that Jesus went underneath and went to sleep. A great storm arose, and the Bible says that the disciples were greatly afraid, fearing for their life, woke Jesus up and said this to him and says, Don't you care? We're going to die. And so Jesus wakes up, and he goes to the front of the boat and says, Be still. And the waters and the winds calmed. But then he turned to his disciples, and once again, he didn't say, all right, guys, let's talk this through. Come on, let's have therapy right now. No, he turns to them, and he said, where was your faith? So in other words, Jesus said, you should have not had this response. There should have been a different response that you guys had in the midst of this storm. And we'll look at that a little bit further and dissect it a little bit more. But another scenario that we see, much like that one over in Matthew chapter 14, if you recall, the Bible says that Jesus says, okay, get in the boat, go to the other side, I'll meet you over there. And so they're on the boat just doing their own thing. And a great storm arose. And so it's rocking and reeling, and the Bible says that as they're on the storm, I mean, you can just imagine this. This, this would have had to been kind of a, 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 a well, it had to war, wear on you. Put yourself in the position. I mean, it's thunder and lightning, and you know that every horror movie that you watch, it's got thunder and lightning going, <laughs> you know. It's thunder and lightning, and then they look out on the water, and somebody's walking on the water. And they're like, dear God, there's a ghost on the water. Right? Like I said, thunder and lightning goes with all the scary stuff, right? <laughs> There's a ghost on the water. And then one says, wait a minute, it kind of looks like Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, it's me. And Peter says, if it's you, ask me to come out there on the water with you. And so he says, come on, Peter. So Peter gets out, starts walking on the water. And he's doing a good job. But then the Bible says he takes his eyes off Jesus, starts to look at the storm, and cries out for fear, and begins to sink. And upon sinking, he cries out, Jesus! Oh, come on. How many of you have ever cried out with that squealy voice in the midst of being afraid? Jesus! <laughs> he cries out, and the Bible says that Jesus is so close, he reaches out, grabs him by the hand, and lifts him up. They walk back to the boat, get in the boat, and you know that Peter's just breathing hard, his heart's beating, you know, and he's expecting Jesus to say, okay, come on, let's talk this through, man. You all right? Everything good? Did a good job? You're the only one that got out on the boat? It, it, he didn't say that. He said, oh, you of little faith. In other words, he said it this way. This is how I would say it. You pansy faith. You pansy faith, Peter. See, he used to be called the rock, but now he's pansy faith, pansy faith Peter. He said, you got pansy faith. He says, why didn't you believe? So once again, just briefly looking at those for a moment, you see that in the midst of having the opportunity to be fearful, Jesus did not coddle their fear. In fact, he rebuked them for being afraid. I said he rebuked them for being afraid. And as I said before, as a believer, it is never okay to be afraid. Say that with me. Say, it is not okay to be afraid. Say it a little bit more with conviction. It is not okay to be afraid because I'm a believer. Amen. Now, I know for some... You've got to choke down those words, and you might even be saying it, but it's like, yeah, whatever. It's hard for us to hear those words in such an absolute statement. And if we left it just at that, that could defeat us. Don't be afraid. Well, let me qualify that statement, because once again, Jesus was tempted just like you and I were but yet without sin. So are we going to have oppositions to be afraid? Is there going to be times where storms arise? Absolutely. 
Are you going to have a good excuse to be afraid? Yes. Are you going to feel it in the midst of your, your core? Will you, your knees shake at times? Maybe so. But just because you're feeling the effects of the giant of fear does not mean that you're cowarding the fear. And in the midst of it, God says, I've given you some things that will help you live victorious over the giant of fear. And not only live victorious, but slay that giant. Now let me give you a verse here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, I'm going to read it from the Passions translation. And this is amazing. It's an amazing verse. But let me just... Start out by saying, because you've heard this verse before. You know, the Bible says that God won't give you anything that you can't handle, right? Does it say that? Are you sure? Are you sure? Do you ever read your Bible? Because your Bible don't say that. People oftentimes quote it that way. God won't give me nothing that I have that I can't, can't get through. God don't ever give you nothing except blessing the bible says that god will never allow you to go through something that you can't handle the stuff doesn't come from him but it says he's aware of what's coming and he will not allow you to go through more than which you can handle now look at how it's stated here in the message trans or excuse me the passion translation now, if you'll hear this, in fact, let me pause. Hear this as though Jesus is talking right to you. It says, We all experience times of testing, which is normal for every human being. Did you hear the qualification? If you're a human, you're going to face times. It's going to be there. You're going to have times that's normal for every human being, but God will be faithful to you he will screen and filter the severity, the nature, and the timing of every test or trial you face so that you can bear it. And each test is an opportunity to trust him more for along with him, or excuse me, for along with every trial, God has provided for you a way of escape that will bring you out of it victoriously. Did you hear that? God says he knows what's coming your way. And therefore, he says, he filters it in its severity, in its nature, and its timing. So if you're going through something right now, God has already filtered it and has already determined this is not bigger than you. Oh, but it's big, but it's not bigger than you. Because God has already sifted it and saw that you are victorious on the other side of what you're dealing with right now. Praise the Lord. And then it says, in the midst, not only does he see that you can have victory on the other side, he's provided a way of escape and has already saw you victorious in it. So that means when the storm is rising, what do you do? You raise a hallelujah. Well, why can I raise a hallelujah in the midst of the storm? Because he's already provided a way of escape, and this is not bigger than me. Amen. Oh, come on. This is, this is better news than your amen and a respond. And I'm telling you what, there is no storm, no news. There is no results from the doctor that is bigger than your God that lives on the inside of you. Amen. Now, when you think about that in regards to just life, he says, now, there's going to be things, there's testings and trials that come your way, and that's normal just to be a human being. And so there are things that we experience in this life that have an opportunity to shake us. For instance, you, you've been having some symptoms in your body, and you go to the doctor, and the doctor says the C word. It's cancer. Upon hearing that word cancer, how many of you know that for so many people, that rocks them to the core because they said it's cancer? Or what about the other word, especially in this culture, the other C word? You got COVID. Well, why are people so fearful 
of something called cancer or something called COVID, it's because they've heard about something attached to it that people have died. And so the thing that I'm afraid of or fearful of is not the cancer or the COVID. It's really I'm afraid to die. Right? I don't want to die. And so as a result, we have the opportunity to become extremely fearful. But there is no storm in our life more powerful than what we have given it power to, to have. There is no sickness that does not have any great substantial, uh, substantial power over our lives. Even in the midst of the doctor telling you, you've got the most radical form of cancer and you've only got a matter of weeks to live, that cancer still does not have the power to control your life. And that radical form of cancer, its days are numbered and it will die. And you might say, well, that's awful strong talking. You said cancer will die? Well, I've heard of it killing people. But my point is, I want you to see that sickness and disease, the calamities of life, the storms of life, do not have the power to control us only to the point that we've allowed it. Now, let me give you an example. Let's say the worst happens, and you happen to die from that radical form of cancer. I mean, really, is it that bad? I mean, I get to go to heaven. <laughs> I mean, I got there a little bit early. But man, I mean, I'm in heaven. And, and, and I can guarantee you that if ever anybody's ever went to heaven, they don't want to come back. All right? So it, it, the alternative's not that bad. And obviously that's the extreme. But now, you have cancer. And you die from the cancer and they have the funeral and they put your body in the ground and the cancer that killed you is still in your body does that cancer still live once it's in the ground nope the only way that cancer can live is if you're alive so that shows you that cancer has a shelf life it will die the question is is will it die because you tell it to. You're not going to kill me. In fact, I'm going to kill you. You giant of fear. Come on, somebody. And you might say, well, how do I address that? Well, I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you asked because we're going to address that. Because once again, when you have cancer, when you have uh, COVID, when you have anything else, any other storm of life that presents itself to you, the Bible says that he has made a way of escape and has already saw that you have victory. So let me read this verse to you once again. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Think of it in the context of the doctor just said you had cancer. Oh my gosh, I've got cancer. Listen to these words. We all experience at times testings, which is normal for every human being. But God, but God will be faithful to you. He will screen and filter the severity, the nature, the timing of every test and trial that you face so that you can bear it. Bear it means not just tolerate it and get through it to the end until it kills you. No, he says, but each test is an opportunity for you to trust him more. For along with every trial, God has provided you a way of escape that will bring you out into victory. He didn't say that this is going to end with you dying and everybody boohooing at your funeral. He says, no, there's a way of escape that will bring you out to victory. So that means if you've got a bad report, if the bank is foreclosing, there is an escape and a victory on the other side. Come on, somebody. Now... Let me also make a qualification in regards to this because, again, I know oftentimes we have this dialogue or this internal dialogue if it's not being said. And it has the opportunity to move us. As believers, we hear these kind of things and we're like, well, yeah, praise the Lord. But I know somebody. 
I know somebody that had cancer. I know somebody that had COVID. I know somebody that got a divorce. I know somebody that died. They were somebody close to me. And as a result of the closeness and the relationship, oftentimes the response of that person moves me out of my faith. But here's the question that we've got to ask. And some of this is not just spiritual discernment. Some of this is just natural common sense. Because we look at people and, you know, they, 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 they died because of sickness in their body. And we find out that there, there was all kinds of complications. Well, why was there all kinds of complications? Well, because they ate horrible. They abused their body. They smoked, they drank, they did whatever. And so they abused this house that God gave them and ultimately they they wore it out and then when sickness comes knocking on the door the house isn't able to withstand the storm because they've beat up the house so much but then we look at the outcome and say well they were a Christian but how come they died well let's again use common sense to say man they just did not take care of the house God gave them now, God can still do a miracle in their life, but on the other side of that, what does it do? It only prolongs it for a little while if they don't do anything to fix the house. Come on. Or we see other people that we're close with, and we say, well, they died, and they were, they were praying, and they were believing God, and we were praying for them. How many of you know that you can pray in fear and pray in faith, but one is not the same as the other? And prayer is not just prayer. So you can say, well, man, we were praying for them. They were a Christian and they were praying and asking God to heal them. If they're just praying and don't know God. And how many of you know a lot of believers are going to heaven but never knew God along the journey. And so therefore, their prayers are nothing but a hope and a wish rather than a confidence in who God said he is and what he will do. And because of that, we let it move us and we say, but they were a believer. They were praying. Don't let their life move you in the trust and the knowledge that you have of God in your life. The outcome in their life does not mean that God was not faithful. Is that making sense? Because you can let the outcome of somebody else's life or outcome move you out of a position of faith and get you into fear. But God's faithful to you. Say it with me. Say, God's faithful. Are you doing okay? So when we look at Jesus, I said that Jesus was not one to coddle the disciples. <laughs> They're there, you know, it's okay. I know he's afraid. Yeah, that lightning bolt was close. Yeah, that thunder's really loud. Man, the waves are really big and the boat's filling up. You, you've got every reason to be fearful. No, he didn't do that. Remember when we see what Jesus did in the boat in Luke chapter 8. We see that he turned to them and said, where is your faith? Here's another way of saying what Jesus was implying. Why did you not do what I just did? Did you hear that? In the midst of the storm, Jesus took control of the situation. He rebuked him for not having faith and getting into fear. But ultimately what he was saying is, why did you not do what I just did? You might say, well, what is that? Well, in Luke chapter 8, there's two things that we see Jesus doing that sets the example. First of all, we, we, we know that Jesus said right from the beginning, let's go to the other side. So upon him making the declaration, he already knew that it was a settled fact. And when he got in the boat, the Bible says that he went to sleep or he rested. When you're in faith in the midst of a storm, you can still have rest. Then the second thing that we see him doing is he stood up and spoke to the storm and said, stop it. Why could he say stop it? Because he was speaking from the position of what he had said to begin with. I said we're going to the other side, and therefore I'm telling you to stop. And Jesus said, why did you not get up there and tell it to stop? Because I already told you we're going to the other side. Amen. 
So he said, I've given you tools. I've given you things to make a way of escape. And what is that thing that we have? It is the very thing that's under your nose. It's your mouth and it is your tongue and it is your voice. To speak to the storm when the storm arises. Come on, somebody. Say, I'm speaking to my storm. Now, once again, we see this through the examples that we've already shared with you. I know that we're going back and rehearsing some of the things that we've shared. But concerning the story of David and Goliath. There was the giant that was standing before them. And do you realize that the army of Israel was not defeated because of the giant that stood before him? They were defeated because of the giant of fear that got in their heart. And the Bible says that when they're standing there, the Bible says that the enemy paralyzed them by fear through taunting them day and night. How many of you have ever noticed that fear, in the scripture tells us this, that fear is tormenting? It talks to you all night long. You wake up in the morning. It's talking to you when you get up off the side of your bed. Your eyes poke open in the middle of the night. It's there to talk to and have a conversation. Right? It will taunt you day and night. So the voice of fear begins to be this rehearsed conversation of thinking in your mind. And isn't that what happens when you get the bad report? It's cancer. It sets you back on your heels and the whole ride home. You're thinking, he just told me I had cancer. And then you get home to the spouse or to the kids. You told me I have cancer. And you try to eat dinner at night, but you can't eat dinner because you're so consumed. I, the doctor said, I've got cancer. And you try to go to bed at night and you can't go to sleep because all I'm thinking about is the words that he said, I've got cancer. And this voice and these words keep being rehearsed in my mind. Now, I'm going to share two things with you, or two statements. First of all, just using the example, let me read this verse to you once again. Hear this and put yourself in the position. Be realistic with yourself. But listen to this verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. We all experience at times testing, which is normal for every human being, but God will be faithful to you. Put your name in that place. He will screen and filter the severity, the nature, the timing of every test and trial that, that you face so that you can bear it. And each test is an opportunity for you to trust him more. For along with every trial, God has provided for you a way of escape that will bring you out victoriously. That's one statement. You just heard it several times here at church. But now... You go to the doctor's tomorrow, and the doctor says, it's confirmed, it is cancer. What statement is going to hold a greater reality in your mind? What statement are you going to rehearse more? Because this is the crossroads for every believer. He said that I've already filtered the severity of what you're going through and I've provided a way of escape and I'll bring you through to victory. But if you don't see that and all you see and hear is the voice of the giant, you'll succumb to the report. Did you hear me? Because this is where the rubber meets the road in the life of a believer. What is the greater truth in my life? What God said or what the doctor said? You say, well, how do I know? How do I know what's the greater truth? What are you rehearsing more? What is the voice that you're hearing more? Are you hearing God say, I'm bringing you through to victory? Or you hear bad report, bad report. Bad report. Are you tracking with me? And unfortunately, this is where the rubber meets the road. 
I joked about it to begin with, and I said it would be interesting to know how many people actually read the Bible. If you're not a person that gives time to reading your Bible now, please understand, there might be new believers watching or new believers that are here, and God is gracious to help you mature and grow. But if you've been around here for a length of time, if you've been here two, three, four, five, ten years, and you still don't know the Word of God, then when the obstacle and the storm of life comes, you may not make it. I know that's a strong statement. But if you never give place to the Word of God in your life that you don't actually begin to take it as God speaking to you and that it becomes a reality to you, that you don't have a scripture like 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that says, I've made a way of escape for you. I've already filtered it, and it cannot beat you. It is not bigger than you. I know it sounds big, but it is not bigger than you. If that is not a reality to you, then the, the, the giant of fear will overcome you every single time. You doing okay? Now you might say, man, it's hard preaching. Well, you realize that if I wasn't a good pastor, I wouldn't tell you the truth. I'd just let you keep on thinking that you're doing good, just being half carnal. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? <laughs> right? Now, we're winding down short on time, and so maybe we'll pick this up a little bit to finish it next week. But let me just wrap up with this line of thinking. In regards to fear, God said, I've made a way of escape. I said, the way of escape is in your mouth. When David came up to the battle lines, everybody was hearing the same thing, but the army of God that was told time and time again, the battle belongs to the Lord, but yet they succumbed to the giant of fear and were paralyzed. Yet David came hearing the same thing and says, wait a minute, who is this guy? He says, I'll fight him. Now, did you see what the, the soldiers and King Saul began to do? Well, here, let us put our armor on you. Let, let, let's put the, the battle gear on you so that you can go to battle. And for those that will succumb to the giant of fear will turn and revert to natural things. And there's nothing wrong with using natural things. But if you don't have faith in God, the only confidence that you'll have is in the natural things of life. And David said, I've not tested this. I can't use this armor. The only thing that I know is God. He delivered me from the lion and the bear. And today, I know how I'm going to fight him. I'm going to present myself as a child of God, and God will deliver him into my hands. Did you hear what I said? If you don't walk a life of faith, the only thing that you'll have is the natural things of man. And when they come to an end, and there is no end, and there is no hope, then you'll cry out with desperation, God, why have you forsaken me? And he says, you've not learned how to trust me and follow me and know my voice. And all you've done is relied on the natural things of life. But what did David do? He steps up to the battle line and the giant is standing there and begins to mock him and taunt him. <laughs> you think you got victory? I don't know why you came here. Oh, you think there's a way of escape? There's no way of escape today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you. And I'm going to kill everybody else that's here and you're going to serve us as slaves. And what did he say? What did David say in response? See, this is the key. He responded and spoke to the giant of fear and says, Today you come at me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come in the name of the Lord. And he said, And today I will take your head. So he did not come and say, well, I've got the sword that they gave me. I got the armor. I've got the, the medicine. I've got this. I've got that. He says, no, I've come in the name of the Lord. And so you'll have to begin to talk to the giant of fear and remind him of what the word of God has said. Amen. Once again, let me close with this. For the sake of time. I know I've shared it several times already, but I want you to hear this 
so that in this upcoming week, when you're facing the challenges and the storms start to form, and it seems as though it's still off in the distance, but it, man, it's looking dark, it's looking treacherous, it's looking like a monster storm breathing down your neck. I want you to hear God speaking to you, and I want you to remind yourself, but in the midst of the, the storm forming, I want you to begin to remind the storm of what God said. God says to you, he says, we all experience it, times of testing, it's normal. Every human being goes through it. But God, I will be there and be faithful to you. I will screen and filter the severity, the nature and the timing of every storm, every disease, every trial that you face so that you can bear it and get through and each test, each storm, sickness, disease is an opportunity for you to trust me more. For along with every trial, I, God, have provided you already with a way of escape. And it's bringing you out into victory. That's his word to you. Victory is yours. Let's stand. With every head bowed and every eye closed, say it with me. Say it don't matter the storm. It don't matter the trial. There is a way of escape that's leading me to victory. Victory is mine. Fear, you will not control me, for I have overcome. For greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I am victorious. If you believe that, just shout praise. Come on. Hallelujah. Praise God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you. Oh, we have the victory. Fear has to bow to a man or a woman that will stand up and say, not today. You realize that victory covers you and it will intimidate every giant that opposes you when you know who you are. Amen? Amen. Amen.